Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again uh, for another episode of our show, bringing another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow uh, for many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor uh, of being joined by Professor Shilizi Marwala who is Undersecretary General of the United Nations, as well as Rector of the United Nations University, uh, which is a think tank and academic arm of the United Nations. Uh, they're headquartered in Tokyo, Japan, with diplomatic status as a UN institution. And their mission is to broadly to help resolve global issues related to human development and welfare through collaborative research and education. Uh, prior to taking this current role as rector of the university, Professor Molala served as vice chancellor and principal of the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, and had previously served as that university's deputy vice chancellor for research and internationalization and executive dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. Uh, Professor Mawala has been a visiting scholar, professor at universities around the world from the United States, UK, China, and South Africa, and his research is quite multidisciplinary, focused on theory and applications of artificial intelligence to everything from engineering, social sciences, economics, to politics, finance, and medicine. He served on a variety of global and national policymaking bodies, including UN entities, UNESCO, UNICEF, the WHO, and WIPO. Uh, Professor Moal has a PhD from Cambridge with a focus on artificial intelligence and engineering, master's in mechanical engineering from University of Pretoria, and did his bachelor's uh, at Case Western Reserve. Um, and needless to say, he's extensively published with hundreds of articles uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, as well as 20 books <laughs> and numerous accolades and awards. We will put them all in the bio of the show. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Professor Shilizi Moala, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. No, no, thank you very much, Ira, for inviting me to come and speak. Uh, uh, I'm quite uh, glad that you're speaking from Philadelphia. Uh, when I first arrived in the United States, it was one of the, the cities I visited. In fact, I visited uh, Philadelphia before I even visited Cleveland, where Case Western Reserve University is. Excellent. It's, it's, it's a nice city. So I'm glad, I'm glad you were here uh, in the city of brotherly love. So that, that, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it, it's an honor to have you. you know, I, I, I would love to start off. Um, you know, I, I took a look back at, uh, you know, a lot of your, your publications uh, and you've been publishing extensively over the last several decades. Uh, I stopped at your dissertation uh, in 2000, uh, fault identification using neural networks and vibration data. Uh, and, you know, was really amazing. You know, you were bringing uh, artificial intelligence is quite a hot topic nowadays, but you were looking at it uh, a couple of decades ago, looking at things like uh, uh, faults in structures that we may not see and, you know, thinking about vibrations and how this impacts airplanes and, and buildings and everything else that we don't want to fall apart. Talk a little bit about the background here and what got you interested in sort of the intersection of engineering and artificial intelligence. Well, I mean, I think uh, quite interestingly, uh, this topic was inspired by my grandmother. My grandmother couldn't read or write, you know, but she used to make clay pots. And uh, I would accompany her to the river to collect clay and then she would come back and then she would make a, a clay pot. And today when you ask uh, students to do something that looks like a, a complicated structure, they ask you for computer-aided design. And after she has... Uh, 
um, she has uh, made this clay pot, she will put it in the sun. But of course it is not strong enough. Then she will go and put it in the fire and it will be so hot that you could see the red. Uh, uh, and then she will allow it to cool very, very uh, slowly. And afterwards she will actually knock these pots to listen to the sound. And from the sound, she will determine whether it is a good pot or not. And she will sell these pots, you know. And she will tell me that, uh, you know, if it rings for a long time, it is a good pot. If it rings for a short time, it's not a good pot. Of course, in engineering uh, classes, uh, they will teach you that the, if it rings for a long time, it is a lightly damped structure. If it rings for a short time, it is a damped structure. It might mean that something is trapped inside or there is still some fluid. Whatever it is, it is not a good pot, you know. Uh, but of course, my grandmother, knew all those things without knowing the sophisticated mathematics that underlie this. But as she was, uh, you know, selling these pots, we realized that she was throwing away good pots. And the reason for that was because her hearing was deteriorating. Of course, uh, my PhD uh, thesis was exactly on that. Uh, you have a structure, it vibrates. Uh, and then uh, instead of my grandmother's ear, you use sophisticated uh, measuring instruments such as vibrometers, you know, uh, and instead of using my grandmother's brain to make sense of the sound, you use a neural network, which is artificial intelligence, you know. And of course, we know now that uh, uh, these technologies are embedded in structures, are uh, um, based in Tokyo, and we know that uh, um, Japan um, has the misfortune of having quite a number of uh, earthquakes and the buildings have to be monitored and these are some of the technologies that are used to monitor this uh, and we know um, in aircraft which is much much more sensitive to to any form of damage if your car has a crack you don't really have a big problem you know but if an aircraft has a crack you have a big problem you know <laughs> uh, so the ability to detect on aircraft structures is quite uh, an important uh, uh, thing to do uh, and of course, uh, um, you can use it uh, even in our hospitals to monitor patients that are in intensive wards. Um, and of course, uh, it has become much, much more uh, uh, widespread technology than when I was doing it uh, exactly 24 years ago, I was completing a, a, a PhD. So, yeah. Awesome. No, I, 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 said, I, enjoy, I, I really enjoy that story, but I enjoyed reading <laughs> <laughs> about your work back then but you know since then you know you have been um really applying uh as mentioned in the bio artificial intelligence everywhere uh and this has been a um a hot topic for us you know we've talked about ai from everything from uh finding oil wells to predicting volcano eruptions to even uh selecting flavor profiles for for whiskeys but a, a very you know important set of topics has been healthcare uh and the biosciences and this is something that again i noticed you know in going through your extensive publication history you spent a lot of time um publishing on on the intersection between ai and health uh everything from nuclear medicine imaging uh this really interesting set of papers on on the barrel reflex uh to obviously COVID-19 and, and and specifically, you know, you were looking at spreading rates in South Africa and using it for that. Um, talk about why healthcare became so important to you uh, as a theme uh, sort of for, for the tool of AI. Well, I mean, healthcare is some, bringing down healthcare is, is, is something that we have to work on. Right. Uh, the cost of health, uh, healthcare um, it, it must mu must be brought down so that many people can have access to that. Yeah. Uh, it is actually quite uh, concerning that even in some of the most developed countries in the world, you still have lots of people who do not have the privilege of seeing a doctor. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, so uh, um, and what is to be done? And I think one of the things that should be done is to ensure that uh, the cost is brought down. How do you do it? I think part of the reason is to use technology is to use technology to do things that, that normally would be done by a human being. You know, technology tends to be much cheaper to be able to do these things. But in addition to that, it it is proving to be much more accurate than, uh, than a human doctor. And there are many, many reasons why an, an AI-assisted diagnostic tool uh, 
would be much, much more effective than a human being because he does not get tired. It's not influenced by 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 whether it slept for doesn't even sleep you know <laughs> uh, whether uh, a human doctor would would sleep and depending on whether they slept for 4 hours or for 8 hours uh, that will have an impact on their performance the following day you know so that is what uh, drove me into that uh, i come from south africa the part of south africa where uh, you would have to wait for 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 hours sometimes days to see a doctor and uh, I was saying that c- couldn't some of these diagnoses be done by a machine, you know? And of course they can, but they can only if you have good data. That is very, very important. If your data is complete, which we don't necessarily uh, think it is the case uh, universally across the world. And it also works if you have huge amounts of database. So uh, a unified database that, uh, uh, and all its uh, uh, its uh, implications on, 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 on privacy and so on and so forth becomes an important issue, you know. So we have worked quite a great deal and I've had the benefit of working with uh, quite an array of people. Uh, we actually have um, uh, uh, quite a number of United States patents uh, in the subject. Uh, yes. And um, I had the benefit of working with uh, my colleague uh, in Johannesburg, David Rubin, um, Brian Wigdorovitz, uh, 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 um, uh, Megan Russell, uh, Maya Peretz, uh, all, all those people uh, to ensure that we can be able to use technology to bring down the cost of healthcare and increase the accuracy of diagnosis. Excellent. Yeah, and, and we'll get a, a little more into that when we when we come back, sort of talking about the uh, uh, Secretary General's, you know, recent uh, convening of the of the body at the UN to talk about sort of broad AI issues. Um, but before we get there, let's talk a little bit about where you are now, because uh, you're in you're in Japan. Um, the uh, United Nations University um, is, you know, it was, uh, from what I was reading, originally proposed back in the late 1960s by then uh, Secretary General Utant, uh, proposing the establishment of it, uh, approved uh, founding in 1972. Um, talk a little bit about why, why you're, why you're in Japan. A little of the background uh, story there. Um, and then ultimately, how you found your way from you know what everything you were doing in, at University of Johannesburg uh, to ultimately being the rector of this really important um, international university, the first actually international university. I was reading about that as well. No, no, absolutely no. I mean, the United Nations University is special in many ways. Yeah. I used to be the president. Uh, we call them vice chancellor. Uh, the United States is the equivalent of a president yeah. of University of Johannesburg, which has right. fifty thousand students, eight thousand staff members, and is one of the highly ranked university in the African continent. And what is the problem with national universities? There's nothing wrong with national universities, but they always act to the best interest of the locations where they are based. Uh, so, and and United Nations University. He, uh, that is created so that it can advance issues that are of global con- concern. And of course, I'm the seventh rector of United Nations University, uh, certainly the first one from the African continent. The first one, uh, James Hester, uh, came to United Nations University after having been president of New York, New York University. Uh, the second one, uh, Sujamoko, came after having been the ambassador of Indonesia to United States. The third one, De Souza, uh, came after having been a president of a university in Brazil. Hans van Ginkel was the president of, of university in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. And Conrad, um, he was uh, at EHE, uh, rector of, of, of uh, ETH in Zurich, and David Malone was a diplomat from Canada. So we are here in Japan as um, as one of the agencies of the United Nations. In fact, we are the only agency of United Nations in Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the agencies of, uh, of United Nations are in Europe, whether it is uh, UNESCO, whether it is the Human Rights uh, uh, um, Agency, whether it is... Uh, 
the refugees, whether it is uh, the, the World Health Organization, uh, UNDP is in United States. So we are here because um, certainly Asia is important um, from an economic perspective, uh, and therefore we have to be we have to be here. Now, how did I make a move from Johannesburg to United Nations? Uh, when I returned back to South Africa in 2001, uh, and I was coming from uh, my first my first academic career was at uh, Imperial College London. I I never actually thought I was ever gonna leave the African continent because uh, um, you know the problems that are being solved are important, are urgent, the needs are high, and we cannot afford to leave the African continent behind. Um, so uh, so I really enjoyed uh, working at the University of Johannesburg, but when this call came that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a possibility that I will go and work for United Nations. I realized that not only would I be working for South Africa, but I would be working for the rest of the world to deal with problems that all of us must be concerned about. The problems of co the problems of pandemics, for example, we must be concerned about. The problems of climate change. I was just at the COP28 uh, in, uh, in UAE, and, and it is clear that all of us must come to the party. It is clear that the technologies that are, uh, we call them the transition technologies, the technologies that are necessary for us to move away from fossil fuel, whether it is solar panel, that they have to be universally available, you know, uh, because if they are not universally available, we're not going to be able to deal with this issue. It is clear that in the light of, um, uh, of, of COVID-19, uh, that pandemic data must be allowed to cross borders because if they don't cross borders, there will be a pandemic that is evolving in one part of the world and we will not know about it until it is too late and all of us are going to suffer as a consequence of that and we uh, we have a lived experience when it comes to this. So that is really where, uh, where we are, why I am here at the United Nations and I want to advance um, I want to advance uh, uh, solving global issues together, together with the institutions, both academic and non-academic, uh, political, civil, uh, in all parts of the world. And who just explain who um, the student body is, because, you know, obviously we have uh, profiled some sort of uh, some of the unique universities that we have here in the United States, you know, one, I have, for instance, recently I profiled the National Intelligence University uh, down in Maryland, which is specifically, you know, the, the student body is those in the United States intelligence community. What, what is the student body for the United Nations University? Well, I mean, it's obviously much more global. Uh, sure. uh, 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 we are located in we were in five different countries uh, beginning next year. We are going to be in 13 different countries. Uh, and, 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 and we only do uh, postgraduate uh, degrees, masters and PhDs, uh, global health in Kuala Lumpur, uh, information technology in Macau, um, China, uh, uh, human and environmental security in Bonn. I was just there. Mm -hmm. um, material uh, sciences in Dresden in Germany, yep. uh, economics uh, in um, Helsinki, uh, natural resources in my own continent in, in Ghana, uh, uh, biotech in Venezuela, uh, water, environment and health in, uh, in Canada, Toronto area. Um, and we uh, we we do uh, uh, regional integration in Bruges, uh, the economy of uh, technology and innovation in Maastricht, uh, governance in Guimarães in Portugal, and we have two institutes that are responsible for coordinating policy. Because one of the work that one of our principal uh, objectives is to turn research into global policies. And when we talk about uh, the high level advisory board on artificial intelligence, I will talk a little bit more about that. How do you take universities are good at producing re research, but taking research into the policy domain it still remains a challenge. And many of them can be able to do at the national level. 
at the international level, it becomes even much more tricky, you know, mm -hmm. and that is what we are doing. We take uh, research uh, and it becomes uh, ultimately a policy that guides us, uh, that is governed by by, by ensuring that uh, we we our objective is to is the collective good of all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you were just mentioning, and and uh, we, we're going to be putting the links, obviously, to uh, the university and the bio uh, of the show. And you mentioned all those really um, specific institutions that uh, feed into um, providing uh, the uh, education to address the what's known as the United Nations University Strategic Plan. Absolutely. 2020 2024 um and here you outline three main thematic areas peace and security social change and economic development and then environment climate and energy mm. and we have obviously added, all, all, all very important we've have, we have added the fourth one which is technology, okay and, technology. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and one of the institutes that i have just established now is going to start operating next year is the one that focuses on artificial intelligence. Yep. Uh, that is uh, uh, that we are creating in uh, in Bologna, in Italy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that that yeah. I I appreciate you bringing that one up too because I know that was in the um, sort of the the section on new technologies. But say a few words about this as well because it you know obviously those are the three broad thematic areas. But then there's as you were just mentioning there's all the technologies that are, you know, taught to address whether it's AI or blockchain or all the digital technologies, um, you know, examples of, you know, you, you have programs on wastewater management, specifically if there's a water induced migration, a lot of it's connected and there's a lot of cross disciplinary stuff absolutely. happening here uh, between absolutely. these institutes. Talk absolutely. about that a couple of minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that we have realized is uh, the interconnectedness of, yes. uh, of all these issues. Uh, one of South Africa's prime minister, a long time ago, even before uh, apartheid was an official policy of South Africa, in fact, he was uh, disposed, was Jan Smarts. Um, Jan Smarts uh, uh, used to talk about holism. He wrote a book on holism, that everything is interconnected, and if one pass, part is missing, then the, then the whole becomes weaker. Uh, and, and, and we understand it very well. I mean, the interface between migration and, and peace and security cannot be emphasized enough. I come from a continent where we can have good examples of places where migration um, uh, 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 and conflict are the confluence, uh, and we need to understand it uh, uh, not as in isolation, but uh, as connected. And it's connected to the economy, is uh, uh, economics, uh, it is connected. Uh, technology now comes into the picture, because uh, uh, people are using uh, uh, um, technology to be able to understand uh, this phenomena, but they also use technology to undermine uh, quite uh, uh, available things for the United Nations, such as human rights, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is what we want to do. And what I have seen, I mean, this is just my own observation, is that the world is full of people who understand technology very well but understand very poorly how it interfaces with uh, other aspects of, 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 of our society, you know. Uh, and the, part of the reason is because uh, the much of the education today is still stuck in the first industrial revolution where specialization in one area was valued quite greatly. You would agree with me today that... Uh, uh, there is an emergence of, uh, even at the technological front, I mean, uh, large language models, for example, require somebody to understand technology, but also understand linguistics, you know. And, and it is good to get one person who understands both. Uh, it, it results with a much more efficient system and much more effective system coming out if they understand both rather than understand one in isolation. It turns out that in many parts of the world, you hardly find people who have studied both. You know, you will find someone, you will find much who studied linguistics uh, in isolation or technology in isolation and even technology, specific technology in isolation. 
So uh, the United Nations University is trying to create a cohort of people who are holistic, if I can use Jan Smart's uh, words, in understanding the problems and uh, holistic, not from, uh, because you see, uh, the middle class, uh, the middle class uh, does get that holism uh, uh, from from the dinner tables, you know. <laughs> uh, so they are able to hear about uh, politics, about health, and so on and so forth. They, they are dinner tables, you know. But we are saying that is not enough. It has to come into our classrooms, and it has to come into our classrooms in a much more holistic way, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Speaking of, um, you know, the whole, well, obviously, uh, you know, as you pointed out um, before, I mean, AI is one of these tools that, uh, you know, it, it has a, it has a tentacle in all of these areas and, and your research over the years has, uh, has explored um, m- many of the domains um, that it will it impacts and it will continue to impact uh, into the future. Um, and you know, we, I mentioned earlier on uh, about Secretary General Guterres convening this body recently to debate um, well governance of AI um, and bringing together sort of this high level body uh, to to create a report uh, at the end of this year on uh, on this perspective. Just talk about. Uh, What's been going on specifically on this front? Because I know you've been integrally involved in this, but yeah. if you can say a couple of words about this, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the papers that you've written recently per UNU. Well, I mean, I think uh, it is clear that we need to have a global governance on AI because of its importance. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, my latest studies shows that uh, the uh, 67 countries have some form of strategy on AI. Um, one of the most recent one is the executive order from the president of the United States on AI. And all these things are fragmented. I mean, let's just look uh, at one very important uh, part of AI, which is data. Yeah. Cross-border data, for example, which is a big problem for us. Uh, cross-border data, and it's a from a personal perspective, it is even a bigger problem because I have moved from South Africa to Japan. And what I wanted is to ensure that uh, my doctors in Japan have access to my medical record in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And of course, you cannot be able to just easily move uh, medical records like that. You know? So now, uh, 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 and it is quite clear that uh, part of the things that needs to be done is harmonization. Yeah. Because if you are going to move medical data um, we have to ensure that we agree on principles. Mm-hmm. In the United States, you have principle, a principle, a very important principle of informed consent when your data is being used. You know, uh, 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 other countries might not have that. You know, uh, uh, and because you know there is this harmony in in, in regulatory frameworks, uh, then you can't be able to transfer data from one part of the world or not because. Uh, um, from the United States perspective, if you can't guarantee that the data that you have is informed consent, certainly maybe there are problems, there are legal issues that uh, might arise. You know, So uh, the same with uh, artificial intelligence, that we need to have a global standard. We know what needs to be done. We know what are the ethics. We know what are the principles. They're in From the United Nations perspective, they are based on two documents the UN Charter, and the Declaration of Human Rights. And I have to remind that uh, the chairperson of the committee that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the former First Lady of United States, you know, uh, that obviously was the wife of uh, 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 Roosevelt, you know. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was actually... The, the, the chairperson of that committee. So those two documents actually define us. Now, what is the objective? In fact, the objectives are twofold. The first one is to maximize the good that comes out of this technology. Mm-hmm. The second one is to minimize the harm that comes out of this technology. And in engineering class, they tell you that if you have more than one objective, we call it multi-criteria objective function, 
And it depends on your values, which one you value the most. Whether you value uh, uh, the pursuit of profit and more applications, or you value um, a, 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 a regulated pursuit, which takes into account human rights and so on and so forth. You know, uh, And we call that whole uh, choice uh, a regime uh, the Pareto frontier. So where you are on the Pareto frontier depends on your values. And of course, United Nations University will have a view on that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, and then what, what we also need to do is to find a mechanism, mechanism that will ensure that uh, we maximize the, depending on where we want to be in the Pareto frontier, the good that comes of this the, the, this technology and the the harms that, that uh, potentially can come out of this technology, mm -hmm. and the mechanisms will include incentives. It will include uh, disincentives. Uh, it will include uh, the structure of the governance model, and we have good examples in which um, uh, potentially harmful technologies have been governed. I think. Uh, uh, the uh, nuclear technology and uh, and its non-proliferation is a testament of a success of such governance model. You know, the biological weapons and uh, and the fact that they are not uh, widely proliferated is another example. And we have a resolution fifteen forty that deals with that. You know, so uh, so we want to get something out of that. And, and as you're, you know, talking about uh, maximizing the good and minimizing the bad, you know, you've been writing, um, you know, quite a few papers lately uh, per the UNU on these various topics. And, and I thought we'd just touch on a couple of them just because they're extremely timely. Uh, and, and one, you know, obviously had to do with your, uh, your paper, Militarization of AI has severe implications for global security and warfare. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, this is, one of the ones that people everywhere are talking about that are extremely concerned of any what camp they're in, whether we should be doing anything <laughs> uh, related to the defense uh, domain, um, uh, you know, God forbid, whatever happens accidentally. I mean, I, we, I spent time talking uh, with um, uh, on a previous episode with uh, Arakli uh, Berenze at the, uh, the Center for AI and Robotics at the uh, UN Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. Talk about bad people doing bad stuff. Okay. The issue of militarization brings up the themes of, you know, as you point out, look, um, you might have good governance mechanisms, but things could still, you know. Well, I mean, I think, I, 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 I think one thing that we need to note is that this is a, a technology that is easy to spread. Yeah. And the technology itself is actually simple technology is less simple than nuclear technology, even though nuclear technology is 80 years old. Yeah. This technology is very, very easy to spread. A multilayer perceptron is a simple model. To train it is simple. Uh, to distribute it is simple. Uh, very, very simple. You can actually send it via an email <laughs> quite <laughs> easily, you know. Uh, you don't necessarily need a physical infrastructure. Of course, you do need computational infrastructure. Uh, that is why uh, um, the chips are some 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 versions of the chips are are strategic, and, and we I have issued a policy brief on that yep. uh, that uh, those uh, that have potential of uh, of militarization must not be distributed widely. And those that are needed for in health, whether it is for smart watches and so on and so forth, must actually be democratized and must be distributed. And we must find ways in which they can reach as many people as possible, you know, because uh, they don't have any military uh, consequences. You know? Right. So, uh, uh, so now uh, the militarization, and I also want to add, that AI it in itself is not a weapon, you know. That while we are worried about the weaponization of AI, 
we must not lose sight of the fact that there are weapons of mass destruction that we have to be worried about. Right. Nuclear technology is one of them. Biological yeah. weapons is another, and so on and so forth. What AI can do, it might, um, because maybe it can shorten uh, simulations that otherwise would have required supercomputing facilities, it might shorten uh, the... Uh, the identification of uh, ways of making nuclear weapons, for example. We must be worried about that. You know? It might shorten uh, and even allow people to be able to search for new forms of much deadlier biological weapons. And we must be worried about that. You know? So that is the weaponization part that we must be worried about. Mm -hmm. uh, but we must not lose sight of the fact that there are weapons, real weapons, that we also have to be worried about. Now, the question is, now, how do you do it? How do you make sure that it is not weaponized? Especially given the fact that it's such simple technology uh, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be accessible to even non-state terrorist actors which worries me quite a great deal, I must confess. And I'm hoping that uh, the governance model that is going to emerge out of the United Nations uh, is going to uh, come up with a mechanism in which we can be able to disincentivize the weaponization of this technology and incentivize the peaceful use of this technology in health, uh, in conflict prevention uh, and so on and so forth. Just um, three weeks ago, you published another really interesting uh, document, and this one was entitled Artificial Intelligence and International Relations, A Whole New Minefield to Navigate. Um, and it's, you know, you go through an extensive um, list of, you know, all the things that, we need to be thinking about um, as AI permeates our uh, our international relations between countries. But you point out the very beginning, like, look, um, international relations is all about connecting with one another. Um, and now we're putting machines and <laughs> AI in the middle of that process. Um, talk a little bit about, again, we want to maximize the good and mm. minimize the bad here but say a few words about this because this in, in some ways is is a little scarier it, it's nice when we communicate with one another uh and then we know that the nuclear weapons uh, is sitting over here um but when we're interjecting ai into in a very important place where we need to be talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, that concerns me a lot so say a few words about this paper if you would you see uh, uh well it is a tale of two cities, yeah. as Charles Dickens put it. It is the age of wisdom, but at the same time, it is the is the is the age of uh, of despair, you know. And it is the age of wisdom because uh, uh, within the context of international relations, AI can help us connect much more effectively. It can help us understand the nature of that connectivity much, much more, so that we can work much, much, uh, uh, much, much more effectively in connecting uh, our, ourselves and identifying the common goals that we should collectively pursue. Uh, it can be used to understand interstate conflict. We wrote a book on this uh, already more than ten years ago. You know. Uh, so that we can prevent that. It can allow us to be able to uh, interject uh, people who want to harm, uh, who want to harm us. So it, that is that is very, very important aspect. You know. Then there is um, the other side, the age of uh, despair, uh, which is uh, which is really uh, um, now it is being used to undermine, Harmony. It is weaponized. Uh, it is uh, used to uh, uh, to 
to, to basically undermine people's uh, privacy, uh, countries' privacy, uh, espionage uh, that is intended to harm uh, rather than to protect and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, ultimately, it depends on our choice. The choices that we make, it depends on the governance models that we put into place, you know. Uh, it depends on, uh, on on who actually have access to this technology. You know, is it some warlord that is based in some uh, area that is uh, uh, that is hell bent to, uh, to 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 undermine global uh, peace and um, security and justice? You know, uh, or it is uh, used to um, to prevent that what um what's coming up uh for 2024 um obviously uh you know we just touched on on, on a couple topics uh, but you know there's uh, and again people that are watching and, and listening to our discussion now uh, we'll take the link and they'll go to uh united nations university website and see everything that's happening but what are what are some critical uh uh, things that are coming up. I mean, obviously, it's a 2023 was a an interesting year on the international front. Mm. Uh, I don't need to tell you, but um, things coming up for 2024 that uh, are interesting that uh, you're looking forward to. I mean, you just got back from the COP28. Um, what else should we be looking for in terms of uh, you and uh, things happening on the United Nations University front? Well, I mean, I think uh, globally, I'll start with globally and then I'll come to United Nations uh, uh, University. I think globally, uh, you are going to see uh, much more synthetic data being used to train AI. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that we are developing a policy with regards to the use of synthetic data. This is data that is used to train AI system, but you don't go and measure the data, but you allow the, you, you, you generate it using a computer. It's not as good as the real deal, <laughs> the one, the data that you have measured. Uh, according to the Gartner Group, 60% of all AI systems are going to be trained using this. And I think there's going to be quite a lot of activities around the implications of that on the accuracies of the models. We already know that uh, the world is already fragmented into uh, the data rich part and the data poor part. Yeah. And uh, to augment the data poor uh, part of the world, we use synthetic data with uh, devastating consequences compared to uh, the accuracies that you get uh, from uh, data-rich uh, countries. I think uh, the training of, um, of, of, of models uh, is going to be quite an important issue. And as a result, uh, the access to certain types of computer chips are going to be a big a deal. Um, of whether it is NVIDIA, um, I see that uh, uh, many companies now are, are pursuing their own chips, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, you have the Chips Act, uh, and, and right. there's obviously uh, 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 an issue between China and the United States when it, when it comes to that. Uh, and of course, we have, I have issued a policy brief on uh, on, 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 on semiconductor chips that we think are not strategic from a military perspective and we need to that needs to be uh, uh, um, distributed widely um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, and then of course um, you know from a United Nations perspective we're going to have the summit of the future and the summit of the future has uh, a chapter on uh, technology in science, um, technology innovation, and, and digital technologies uh, uh, where we are going to deal with issues of uh, the digital global compact is going to come into effect where the recommendations of the high level advisory board on AI are going to get into the chapter uh, and so on and so forth. It's going to be an exciting year. Uh, there's going to be a tug of war as to who actually controls this technology. Should mm -hmm. we allow uh, companies to go uncontrolled uh, uh, what is the what is the global implication of the fact that um ninety percent of the investment into AI are located in only two countries, United States and China, 
you know, uh, and so on and so forth. It's going to be exciting here. And from a United Nations perspective, we are going to ensure that this technology, we are going to play our part to ensure that this technology works for the greater good of all of us. Outstanding message. Outstanding message. No, it's, um, you know, a, again, a, a very exciting set of programs. Uh, needless to say, uh, I, I see why you're you're in the role now, especially with uh, your your experience in the uh, um, the role that AI uh, will continue to play as it grows uh, in, in all of these domains. Um, one last thing, I, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, you 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 have offered quite a few books, and everyone listening and watching can can go into Amazon and and check out. I, you have any 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 new books coming out anytime soon, or are you you are you done with the publishing for now? No, no, I actually have a, a, a new book that is coming out. Okay. Uh, the title of the book is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Artificial Intelligence, Behavioral Science and Mechanism Design ah. in International uh, Relations. Because I think the technology uh, is fine. Uh, 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 I think uh, uh, the big issue there that uh, prevents people from having access to this technology is uh, access to data and access to technological uh, or computational uh, uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that uh, as we think about governing this technology, we have to think at uh, various levels. I think we need to think at individual levels because this technology is being developed by people and therefore, the issue of behavioral science becomes an important matter in this whole discussion. Uh, I think uh, the role of governments and institutions are very, very important. And therefore, uh, uh, the science of designing mechanisms that we maximize the good and minimize the bad becomes important. And therefore, mechanism design is important in the governance of AI. Uh, this is a book that I am currently, uh, I've just completed and it's going to appear uh, end of 2024, beginning of 2025. Outstanding. We'll be on the lookout for that. No, really um, a, a, an amazing story um, and journey that you've been on. I'm really honored that you took the time to share it with us. And uh, we will continue to keep our eye on everything going on at the university and with you as, uh, as 2024 uh, unwraps itself. Um, uh, again, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been spending time with Professor Shilizi Mawala, Undersecretary General of the United Nations, Rector of the United Nations University. Uh, Professor, I uh, again, I want to thank you. I know it's early in the morning there for taking the time out of your schedule to, to come talk to us for a little while and educate us all about the United Nations University. Obviously, thank you for what you do. And as we like to say on our show, um, thank you for being involved in, in so many things that make a better tomorrow for uh, people out there. It's a really great story and you know, look forward to continue to watch uh, your journey through this. No, no, thank, th th thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, when you are in Tokyo, please don't hesitate to come to the United Nations University. We actually do offer very, very nice coffee. <laughs> ah, I, 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 then I'm there. I'll, get, I'll be on a plane tomorrow then. I'm, I'm a big coffee fan. Uh, and then we can have a public conversation when you are there here. There we go. There we go. And, <laughs> and, and, and same thing. If you ever if you ever get back to Philadelphia, I'll be on, put me on the contact list. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great having Welcome. you. Okay.